Hi, I'm Cameron Cedar, and in this session, we are going to talk about selecting the right identity provider for Kubernetes, a comparative survey. Now, I work for SUSE as a technology strategist, and I work on many, many of their premium customers' uh, accounts and uh, strategic opportunities. Um, I've worked in this industry for many, many years and have lots of experience in many different areas. And hopefully today uh, you can get some good information from some of the experiences that I've had working with Kubernetes and identity providers. So who do you trust in this ever-evolving web of identities? Um, I hope to be able to talk about uh, identities, the where, why, how, and things, and identity providers for Kubernetes specifically, what uh, identity providers are uh, available, and what uh, are the common markers of interest, and also what uh, common marker comparison is available today and how we can conclude on the right identity provider for me. So let's talk about identities. Now identities have gone through lots of evolution over the past few decades. Um, but if you think back from the invention of the transistor to having billions of those transistors in the palm of your hand today, um, think about what it took as a community to come together to create such invention. Um, and we're mostly throughout time have been creating kind of our own problems and, and unique solutions. And it's all through community. Um, through time, uh, transistors have really changed the world. And if you think about identities in the way that we've evolved um, to having uh, applications running on top of our cell phone, um, our identity authentication has changed in ways that uh, we never even thought possible. Um, so being able to overcome challenges such as um, providing authentication uh, for different types of applications that run, are running on our phone and maybe having that application touch, you know, different identities or even uh, gather information from our identity um, that might be common information that could be used between other applications. Um, so it's kind of interesting how we've kind of helped perfect that. Um, and so by way of communities and technology, we're kind of becoming more perfectionists in this way. And there's two things now that, that really kind of stand out and, and really have evolved, and that's authentication and authorization. So in terms of auth n, which is authentication, and then auth z, which is authorization, there's a few different strategies here. So with auth n, um, you typically have client certificates or SSL, um, or some type of token, uh, whether it be a static token, an open ID connect token, webhook tokens, uh, bootstrap tokens, service account tokens, and these are very common amongst Kubernetes itself. Uh, you could also have a static password or some type of anonymous request uh, if it's temporary. In OSZ terms, there are a few different strategies. We've gone back and forth between RBAC, which is role-based access control, or ABAC, or author authorization control, webhooks, and also node authoriz authorization. <clears throat> We also need to compare things like uh, different protocols. So we have things like SAML um, versus OAuth and OIDC, which is Open ID Connect. And what's interesting over time, uh, SAML has been very um, popular amongst um, identity providers in the past, um, where you just look up an identity and see if that user is able to authenticate based on a password or a token of sorts. Um, but now we've kind of moved into this world of using OAuth um, and OpenID or Open Identity Connect. Um, 
And this methodology, um, combining those two together, gives you the best of both worlds, gives you the ability to both authenticate and do some authorization. Um, so very early on, a lot of these use cases just really used SAML authentication. And because that's really what was all, all that was required. Um, OAuth 2 plus OpenID Connect gives us even more powerful capabilities to be able to do them uh, several ways, plus uh, some single sign-on capabilities, and also be able to um, use those in the, the mobile environment and also providing access to various types of resources. Um, if you think uh, around the time when uh, authentication really started to you know, pop up in mobile phones, there became the idea of, well, I, I need my identity, plus I need to be able to uh, capture you know, contacts, uh, maybe from Google. Um, and so I need to be able to connect that to maybe an application like Yelp. And so uh, having OpenID Connect and OAuth working together gave us that capability. If you see the little, um, uh, the picture on the right, that's a kind of a, the common connection there. We were able to connect our uh, applications to these various applications um, and provide uh, some authorized um, information to that application. Um, and that still goes on today, and many applications use that, uh, use that capability, which makes it a lot more powerful. Um, and we're going to see more of that, of course. Um, <clears throat> so OIDC and OAuth to Infinity and beyond, maybe. Um, so we have Auth N, we've got Auth Z, we've got that seemingly a little bit figured out. But it is complex. Um, it's not something that you just go and start using. You have to learn how it works. You've got to learn how to program for OAuth and OIDC. Um, so for developers, um, it can be very complex. They don't really want or care for uh, managing tokens or cryptography, um, but they want to be able to authenticate users and check their access. And so they need some sort of client library uh, in, order, in order to make that, that possible. Make it really easy. Uh, it's important to bundle in some type of client library for developers so that they can do this really simply and easily. Now, you have the Kubernetes way of authenticating, um, which is fairly straightforward. Um, you have authentication. You've got authorization. And then you have the admission control um, that all takes place within the Kubernetes cluster. Now, Kubernetes provides several different plugins, and there's also the, the basic authentication as well, which is all uh, base64 encoded. And then there's also I, OpenID Connect, and it also has the ability to connect up to LDAP um, and several types of, of token authentication. Um, and you can go on and on, counting the different ways. Um, so there's lots of possibilities there. But if you want to scale that, of course you need an, an identity provider or some other methodology to plug into that. And that's why we have the different plugins. So identity providers for Kubernetes. This is kind of a typical identity provider ar architecture. When it comes to Kubernetes, this is what I see a lot of people doing. Um, and you'll see this you know, very commonly for out-of-the-box solutions for Kubernetes distributions, where you have an LDAP store that has your credentials. Um, you have various users and passwords, et cetera. And you'll typically use DEX. Um, another one might be UAA. Um, but DEX will provide um, the ability for you to plug in with open I, with open with OIDC um, or use some type of other authenticator uh, such as Gangway in order to um, provide uh, login credentials 
and the, the authentication and authorization uh, tokens and to do it in an easy fashion and to really provide it in a way that can make things uh, easier and, and a little more extensible. So do we really still need LDAP in 2020? Well, that's a really good question. Um, and it really might depend on your use case. Um, it's been proven. Um, it's, LDAP's been around for a long time in the enterprise. It's easy to do migrations from other identity providers into LDAP. It's used as a base for a lot of unified single sign-on solutions. And you may already have it somewhere in your enterprise. And it's deployable on Kubernetes. Now, the negative side to that is um, the declarative side of it is, is not always sufficient. Um, and it's stateful. So you really better make a backup um, or you might have some type of a way to synchronize it, um, which may not always be possible, which also doesn't scale very well. Also, uh, in an LDAP sense, uh, a scale out methodology is just not there. If you want to do, um, you know, thousands of logins per second, um, that's really hard to scale uh, with with LDAP. Um, and it's not typically usable as is. And so you have to do a lot of modifications and you have to um, set up your configuration file for SSL and various other things. And you don't get any two-factor authentication. Um, and so you might want to use something like a, a NoSQL database, like Couchbase, for example, um, that help provide uh, an LDAP interface, but yet is able to scale out uh, both in a, a cloud native perspective um, or on premise. Now, uh, portals to the rescue, um, portals to another identity provider. If you are using DEX or UAA, um, you can use these other OIDC clients. There's the gangway, which I just showed in the um, uh, in the architecture example, or you have the DEX Kubernetes Authenticator, uh, which is also available. And there's lots and lots of others. I believe uh, when you Google search it, you'll see at least two dozen different types of OIDC clients that you could possibly plug in with DEX or UAA. Uh, as as a uh, use with Kubernetes, um, but these don't always scale. Um, they don't. Uh, they're not always uh, capable of providing thousands of connections a second. Um, so if you want something that is used both for your Kubernetes administration uh, and for your applications that are running on Kubernetes then this is probably not the solution for you. Then there's the outstanding in the crowd. Um, and these are the ones that actually have some real open source street cred. And uh, we have Glue, um, which their goal is to be among the first vendors to support all of the new essential features of OAuth. Um, and they've done a really impress impressive job with that. Um, and then there's Keycloak, which is also open source. You know, it's driven more so by a Red Hat uh, community. It's open source uh, identity and access management uh, for modern applications and services. And we have Open Unison, uh, which is combining the, com the uh, common identity management functions needed by most applications, including single sign-on, user provisioning, federation, web services, and Open Unison can run on any J2EE containers such as Tomcat or JBoss. And then we have OpenIAM, which started in 2008 um, with this mission of making the business of managing identities effortless using innovative approach. Um, so, they all really have similar goals. 
um, but they their technology differs slightly in implementation. So let's take a look at some of that a little bit. Some of the common markers of interest that that I want to pay attention to are Identity Federation, open source, because if you remember when I talked about earlier, um, going back to, to the tra transistors um, and how those came about and how we now have billions of transist transistors in the palm of our hand, it's always been about community to bring that about. Um, so when you take a look at open source, open source makes a big difference um, in the way that we implement and provide this, this software. Um, if you look at the way that OAuth has formed uh, to be able to tackle these solutions from uh, applications on our phone, um, it was a community of users that came together to create OAuth um, and you know, find solutions to these problems. We'll also look at protocol support for Auth in and Auth Z, uh, different types of second factor authentication, uh, ways of doing user management. Um, do we have automated client registration? Um, do we have different types of backend support so that we can do scale out um, and support up to thousands of users per second? What types of languages are, are we uh, writing this application in. And let's look at the uh, healthy markers of, of a developer community. And, uh, and do we make it easy and deployable on top of Kubernetes? So what's best for me? Let's go ahead and compare these. Um, if we look at these markers that we talked about from a key cloak perspective, yes. Um, Identity Federation is uh, comparable across the board. Every single one of these solutions does provide identity uh, federation. Now, what's really uh, not common amongst them is whether or not that identity federation is provided as an enterprise edition version and you have to pay extra or it just comes completely free. Um, in this case of Glue, um, you'll notice that a lot of the uh, features in fact, everything that you see uh, is what you get. Uh, it's 100% open source. Everything that is provided in the open source version is also in the enterprise version. In the enterprise version, you're just paying for support. Um, and if you need help in setting it up or, you know, it's your insurance, you can call Glue, get great support. They'll help you out with, uh, with anything in, in regards to the software and getting it set up and, and uh, um, getting a solution put together, um, that's what they provide. They are 100% an open source solution. When you take a look at Keycloak or Open Unison or, or Open IAM, all of these have some differentiators when it comes to an enterprise version of the product because they will offer uh, certain extensions to it that provide extra functionality that you don't get in the open source version. Um, so you'll see some differences there uh, as far as, you know, you'll see in some of the documentation, oh, well, this enterprise version uh, will support these extra protocols. Um, so if you look at our the protocol support, uh, they're pretty co common across the board. Um, you'll notice that Glue uh, does provide some extra stuff there. Uh, it's got some integrations with OPA, um, Open Policy Agent, um, UMA, and CAS, um, which Keycloak does have some of that too, but some of that stuff does have a cost to it on the enterprise version. Um, so you have to pick and choose um, which you like better. Um, you like the pure open source, uh, version or, you know, do you like to have something that's a, a multi-source uh, type vendor? There's the second factor authentication. If you compare all of these, uh, they all have similar functionality there. Um, you know, from the, uh, the TOTP or the OTP uh, to the FIDO2 where you're supporting extra devices that uh, 
that you might like to use um, with uh, the U2F uh, functionality. Um, and some of them uh, only provide that functionality as an enterprise edition. Um, for user management, um, they're all pretty common. And some of those interfaces are better than others. So if you take a look at Keycloak, um, really like their interface. Um, it's really user friendly. Um, and uh, what's really nice is it comes with the CLI. Um, the CLI is super nice for administrators if you come from the command line world, whereas the others don't really provide that. Uh, Glue provides a really nice uh, interface uh, as well as Open Unison. Their interfaces are all very, very similar. Um, they're very nice and easy to work with, very user friendly um, as far as user management goes for uh, manage, you know, having user management, um, being able to manage it themselves, going in and changing passwords and things of that nature. They all have the similar types of interfaces, very user friendly. Um, automated client registration, uh, all built in with, with every one of those solutions. And again, their web interface, their interfaces in order to accomplish that are all very capable and very user friendly, very easy to use. Um, as far as backend support goes, um, most every one of them will support your Active Directory's backend, LDAP type backends. Um, anything available there, if it's eDirectory, it's all going to work there. Um, there's others possible um, in some of these, like Keycloak will have some others possible. Uh, they also say you can support some type of databases as well, um, but your mileage may vary as far as uh, whether that whether that's easy to integrate um, or it's easy to follow through some documentation. Um, Glue makes it super easy. It's all integrated with their deployment tools. Um, you can deploy either with um, an LDAP service or you can deploy uh, with Couchbase and it will go through some level of uh, gateway synchronization if you want to connect it to Active Directory or other services. Open Use it. Unison has some similar things as well where it can do that with uh, MongoDB, um, but I've noticed that uh, as far as easily deploying, um, I would I would really give hands down to Glue as far as easy deploying um, because that's built into all of their Helm charts and it just makes it super easy. Open IAM uh, takes a lot more configuration and those Keycloak takes a little bit of extra configuration on that side of the house too. Across the board, they're all mostly uh, delivered in a uh, Java development framework, um, and some uh, are mostly supported on top of things like JBoss or some type of middleware. Um, that might not be true amongst all of them. Open Unison certainly is not. Open IAM certainly not, uh, but some level of J2EE, so you might require some type of Tomcat in order to exe execute it. If it's deployed through the Helm charts, then that's typically going to be uh, taken care of for you. Um, <clears throat> develop, developer communities and all these are pretty well active. Open IAM, I uh, can't really find a lot of the information on, on their, their community development where that's really located. Uh, it seems like some of it was, was in the GitHub and maybe it had moved somewhere else, but it's difficult to find, especially you know, information on their roadmap. Uh, Glue is pretty active. Uh, you'll see um, issues and things and activity going on on a daily basis. Uh, they have a current roadmap available. Uh, Open Unison, uh, the same way, pretty active. Um, I didn't find any you know, active roadmap uh, available there, but I'm sure that they have stuff available if you ask them. Uh, Key Cloak, um, pretty active community. No real active uh, roadmap that I could see from the community, but they're a pretty active uh, community from a, a daily basis uh, with issues they're resolving uh, from a, a weekly basis. Um, so their, their community seems pretty active there. Um, as far as um, uh, the architecture goes, uh, the architecture differs on many of the, uh, on all four of them, really. Uh, you're going to see a mix of 
you know, client libraries that are provided and, uh, you know, some client libraries mixed with some open source client libraries, um, you'll find, you know, a very open source library that Glue is providing, but it's a Glue centric library. So you can, but they provide this extra client library that you can program to, to make things really easy from a developer's perspective. Um, <clears throat> Open Unison and Glue also have support for many different languages. Um, Keycloak has some extra support for languages as well. Open IAM, I'm not quite sure about, but they do provide some client libraries that are common uh, with some common APIs. Um, and then, of course, uh, making this available for all, uh, you know, Kubernetes, making it easy to deploy, um, making Helm charts available. Um, I think Glue, as far as uh, providing all that, but also making it super easy to configure and set up uh, for many different scenarios, Glue has that down pretty well. Um, so if you want the, the easy road there, they do pretty well there. And then if you want something that's certified, I found this to be quite interesting from a certain uh, open, excuse me, an open ID certification goes, you can go out to open ID and check out the certified open ID provider servers and services. Whereas glue has uh, the glue server 4.x uh, certified there, key cloak, is certified, although I was noticing it was a little bit older version, so they're not quite up to date there. Um, there's also the certified financial grade API, and the Glue Server 4.2 is completely certified. That's the newest version. There's also the certified uh, financial grade API for the client initiated back channel authentication profile which again is another certification for a glue server 4.2. Um, I'm not seeing any other uh, of these, um, these IDPs, these identity providers that actually have any commitment or any involvement in the open ID certifications there except glue. Um, I think they're making it a big point to make sure that each one of theirs is completely certified. Um, although others have made attempts and there are others out there, um, you know, they've just been small attempts and they're typically older versions. But I can just use DEX or UAA. Yeah, you could. Um, but I'm going to tell you, it's just really for those solutions where you might be more localized solutions, not a lot of users, might be for just administration of your Kubernetes cluster. It's definitely not going to be for your use case when it involves your applications and you want to build an authentication mechanism for your application stack that you have running there on Kubernetes. You really will want something that's more of an identity provider that you can uh, uh, utilize and scale out, um, give a nice scale out architecture for thousands of users a second, um, depending on your requirements there. Um, but then there's UAA. Uh, UAA is also possible. You have some similar capabilities there with DEX, um, but you're still going to require a client application, um, and there's no certifications with either of these uh, when it comes to uh, the OpenID certifications. In conclusion, I really like to go with the outstanding crowd, um, and it's really because of the, the certifications. Uh, it's really because um, the community involvement, uh, the activity in the community that's going on. Uh, one that really stands out to me is Glue um, because they've really gone the extra mile to get certified. They've gone the extra mile to make everything 100% open source and upstream. They're focused on their community. They're focused on making sure it's open source. They're focused on the open standards. Um, making sure it's enterprise ready, making sure you're innovating, um, you know, focusing uh, on all these OAuth uh, policies and standards, um, various administrator tools that are available, and also developer tools. 
um, from a development perspective, uh, perspective, making sure that you have client libraries available. Um, making sure that you're covering the whole protocol base that's out there because, you know, there's going to be some applications that you might just want to use SAML auth with and others you might want to use open o, OIDC uh, and OAuth and it's coming and you might see it very soon uh, OAuth 3 I think they're working on it now they're working on some uh, different uh, scopes there there's still problems right there's still the community coming together trying to fix uh, solutions to fix problems and come up with solutions to those problems in the community today and uh, we're going to see more changing in that direction but uh, I can certainly see things uh, continue to evolve around OIDC and OAuth as we move forward and just enhancing that making those things better um, hopefully this was useful and and I hopefully enjoyed you know some of the content um, certainly uh, leave some feedback and and I'd like to hear more uh, reach out to me I'm on Twitter um, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn um, and we'll talk to you soon thanks bye